If you've ever wondered what would happen if science and religion had a weird John Carpenter fueled baby, strange analogy, but go with it, you'd probably get Prince of Darkness, directed by John Carpenter, written by him under a pseudonym of Martin Quatermass, a reference obviously to the Quatermass experiment. This stars Victor Wong, Dennis Dunn, Donald Pleasance, and Lisa Blunt. And like I said previously, I'd never seen this before, which is really weird because the idea of mixing religious and scientific themes together is great to me. For those who may not know, I went to a Catholic school for my primary education, or the bulk thereof, and so I've always had a hand in religion of some kind. I've always been fascinated by various world religions, even though now I consider myself agnostic. I literally don't know what's out there. And of course, I've always had an interest in sciences. I did A-levels in physics and I did maths, etc. This is something that really is both sides of me in film. So I've had 33 years where I've just sat there and gone, I don't know about this. Because it's not that I heard about it and never wanted to watch it. I had never heard about it until a few years ago. So that's really weird. But this is an interesting film. It's not, I think, Carpenter's greatest. There's moments that I was waiting for something to happen. There's moments where I was kind of shaking my head a little. But there are some great bits in this. I think overall, it's fine. I, I don't think it's a terrible film at all. Don't get me wrong. It's just not as good as some of the others, like I say. It's weird that it technically is the middle of a trilogy because that's sometimes, in fact, a lot of the time is the case. But this is about science and religion sort of at odds, but somehow in the end needing to kind of work together. We see it a lot now. We do have a lot of current debates between science and religion. You know, religion thinks that science is to blame and science is going to herald the return of Satan. Well, that's literally what this film says, which I think is genius. The idea that we needed to reach a level of development at a certain point so that we could decipher the equations to release, effectively, Satan. It's brilliant. The idea, I mean, we've, we've had people floating the idea around that, you know, Jesus wasn't the son of God. He was an extraterrestrial. Well, this says that too, but even more so, he was a harbinger. He came to warn us about Satan and the father Satan. He came to tell us about these things and basically set up the church to try and cover all this up. And I love this idea. And of course, like I say, they need to use science to figure out what's going on and sort of release it, unfortunately. But we see slowly people get possessed and early on in the film, there is a curiosity, I think, of like, are they completely under? Is there none of them left? I think with people who've died and come back, definitely. Although, I don't know. Because we see later on, Calder has been affected and he's singing Amazing Grace. There is a little bit of him, because we see earlier on he's clearly a religious guy. But we see this battle in him. So I think your ability to resist and your ability to still be in there does have a link to your level of faith. If you are a devout Christian, you will fight back. If you're not necessarily amoral or anything like that, but if you're just not a follower of this particular theistic religion, it probably doesn't have much of you left in there because you haven't got that faith. But I do say it's, it's in question because later on, you know, he obviously ends himself, but later on after he's been revived at that point, you can still see this battle in him. He's crying, he's very upset all the time, even when he's carrying out the action. So I think whatever's left of him in him after the death is still struggling against it. And I think that's really interesting. But there's some great lighter moments in this as well. Obviously, it's very heavy, very dark, and that progressively, you know, sort of gets worse because it's Carpenter. You know, it, it does ramp up, but there are light moments. Like, the, just the idea that we see Alice Cooper early on. I did actually look this up. This is interesting. He just wanted to come to set and watch a film being made. He was just interested in the filmmaking process. And Carpenter said, if you're going to be here why don't you be in it, but do that uh, sort of stabbing thing that you do on stage, that little you know set piece you do, and we'll put you in the film. So he was like, cool, I'll do that. Ironic that he was sort of a possessed, sort of soulless person in this film, and then later became a born-again Christian. I don't know if this was an inspiration for that. But the idea as well that Donald Pleasance's character is literally just called Priest in the credits. 
he has no official name. But over time, people have gone, well, you were Loomis in another Carpenter film, so therefore this is Father Loomis. That's what we're doing. Because, of course, Donald Pleasant has a certain sort of cachet of mannerisms that he uses. He's got a certain way of being and speaking. And that informs a lot of the roles around this sort of period. So how he was in Halloween is very similar here. You know, in how he delivers his line, how he's like, oh no, I could have stopped this. So he does feel like almost Loomis has gone into the priesthood. So I understand that, I like that. But one of the best gags, I think, has to be the running joke with Susan. Who? Radiologist, glasses. The idea that, you know, there is this person there who everyone's seen, but no one can refer to without asking the question. And this, of course, leads me to another weird point. We've had They Live, where John Carpenter used a pseudonym based on Lovecraft. We have this, where he uses a pseudonym based on uh, the Quatermass experiment. But the characters of Wyndham, John Wyndham, and Susan Cabot, which is also a reference to a sci-fi piece that I've forgotten now, I do apologise. Someone correct me or I'll put it in the thing. There'll be something on screen now, maybe. Those are both references. This is a man who loved his sci-fi and his horror stuff growing up, clearly. Especially cosmic horror, as we know, with his love for Lovecraft. But that's, you know, another little thread that keeps on. And of course, this was a collaboration musically with uh, Alan Howarth. But one of the other great light moments, there's a scene where Victor Wong and uh, Peter Jason are talking. And Victor Wong starts walking away. Peter Jason was not expecting this. He was expecting him to still be there. So when he looks up and he's got this visible confusion, that was a genuine reaction. Totally unscripted. Victor Wong just went, I'm going to walk away on this scene. Didn't tell him. And it's brilliant. I love that moment. But this film is a very interesting idea. And like I said, mostly executed well. The fact that they mention Schrodinger's cat earlier on, the idea that, you know, there are so many things happening technically all at once. The idea of quantum superposition. Every possible outcome plays out. Upon observation, that collapses to one outcome, to one point. And that's the idea behind Schrodinger's cat. It isn't that the cat's alive and dead. It's that until you see it, until you know, the cat could be either alive or dead. And technically... The thought experiment was actually done as a joke to make a mockery of these kind of thoughts experiments. But I like the fact that they refer to this, and then we see this green thing, this green goop, if you will, in this, in this jar. And the idea that that, once they've unearthed it, once they're observing it, starts to coalesce into something. It starts to actually infect people and be observed. Its actions collapse. It is a superposition collapsing into an outcome. And I love the fact that they managed to make these threads work. As I say they, Carpenter. This is Carpenter's vision from writing all the way through. The fact that he managed to make sure that we had these threads to follow. And I love it for that. Like I say, there's a lot of moments that could have been sped up. There's some that could have been cut out. I think Dennis Dunn's um, character was very much just a humour uh, piece. You know, there's... Obviously, some things as well that he says that wouldn't fly now, the whole mocking of uh, Lisa being Asian, etc., is a bit... I don't think it would fly today, and his joke about the rich doctor, I don't think that would fly today either. If you don't know what I'm talking about, because you haven't seen the film for a while, just watch it. I'm not going to repeat it here so I don't have people moaning at me. But the time of it being filmed and recorded and released, these things were acceptable in a greater way, and unfortunately in the world. We're a lot more enlightened, as it were, now. But yeah, if you've never seen this like me because it just slipped under your radar, it isn't as well known as They Live. It isn't as well known as The Thing. It's not as well known as Christine, etc. I think that was Carpenter. But it's not as known as these films. And that is something that I think should be changed. So have a look at it. If you haven't seen it for a while, it's spooky season, so stick it on. Why not? watch the Apocalypse Trilogy with me because next week we're talking about The Closer in the Mouth of Madness which will lead me on to something else a fortnight from that because I've got something I want to do in between but I hope you'll join me for all of that and until then as always thank you for watching and take care <laughs>